Good morning. Good morning. It's time for a story. Journal Entry 91. So some crackpot oracle in town, apparently well respected for some reason, runs out of his house in a panic and begins telling everyone he sees that doom is coming to the city unless he is stopped. So the guards panic and arrest the first known off-worlder they see, which is me. So I'm sitting in a street cafe enjoying some hot tea while chatting up a pretty little half-elf chick about Hemingway when blam, arrested. Arrested for suspicion to cause doom. Because of a crackpot oracle saw something in his chicken entrails or whatever he uses. Spent a few hours in the city dungeon. Damp, dirty, filled with assholes and rats. Luckily, prison sodomy is not a phenomenon known to this place. It took a lot of effort to reach out to Marcus. He finally figured it out, thank God, and managed to talk them into releasing me. Could I have escaped on my own? Probably. But they do know where I live. Somehow, we got slightly famous here, between Marcus's Earth music, my Kindle porn, and the artificer riding around on his bicycle every day. Journal Entry 92. So we had our graduation today. No big spectacle, just a handshake. Most of the students have to move out now. We can still stay because the staff occasionally comes up with something new to experiment on us, and the master artificer likes to keep us close. With that in mind, we're paid up with an airship leaving in two days to begin our amazing Odyssey Part 2, The Revenge. So with this in mind, Marcus runs up to me today and informs me that one of the girls he's been with may be pregnant. An elf girl. And she's all ready to settle down so he can be a farmer forever and ever and raise a big family. He's broadcasting anxiety across the building strong enough for every psi on the dorms to pick up on it, and he's not in his right mind. I warned him about getting too comfortable in that barred lifestyle. So first thing he asked me, if I can mind blast it into miscarriage. No. Just no. That's too far. Way too far over the edge. No. I probably could if I tried hard enough, but no. He's not allowed to ask the other students either, or I'll erase his childhood or something. So we went over to less criminal options. Man up and become a farmer. Man up and tell her fuck that shit and dump her. Or run and hide and meet us in the docks in two days and we'll leave all this behind. So he's off hiding until our trip out of here. I let Jason and Mike know this is going to come back and bite us in the ass again. I know it will. Fucking bards. Journal Entry 93. So we're on the airship, the Celestial Rose. It's larger than the last one, and not an obvious conversion of an ocean ship, but styled after one. This one is also not seaworthy. Our quarters are much better, but not by much. At least we have a window this time. It's about 90 foot from stem to stern and 20 foot wide. I feel it's slower than the other one. Maybe because it's bigger. This one is leaving a magical green fire trail behind it as well. Marcus mess in the docks in disguise, and we boarded. No issues leaving. While the people of Winterfield and Brightly thought Aeon was an isolationist city, it isn't. They do open trade, just not in that direction, and it's mainly exports going out and the occasional adventurer coming in. So the captain of this boat is an adventurous, I think they call them shifters? Beast person. Very educated. He clearly wants to be an adventurer, but he's stuck in the family business. He's a glorified truck driver on a motherfucking airship. Maybe if I were in his shoes, I could empathize with him more. Or, you know, mind rape. But I don't want to mess up the captain. The rest of this motley crew is a mix of dock workers and crate stackers, a wizard, and their airship repair officer. There are other passengers, a family of excitable halflings. I haven't seen too many of them around, and they creep me out. Journal Entry 94. We're cruising along the coast, a few hundred feet up. Endless oceans in one direction, seaside plains in the other. The occasional beachgoer or sailing ship passing below. We did stop briefly. The captain wanted to fish. Pulled out a fishing rod and everything, and while everyone patiently waited, fished over the side with the airship 50 feet over the waves. He didn't catch anything after an hour, and he resumed course. Whatever. Hung out on deck past nightfall. Can't see shit out there. Not enough light. The pilot is apparently taking the ship up to a few hundred feet and hauling ass and navigating by dead reckoning. Then corrects his course come sunrise when he can see anything. There has to be a better way than this. Airship guide lights? Glowing, floating, navigational buoys? Marcus is still bleeding anxiety everywhere. 
I think he's finally realizing what he's been doing, and that yes, running away or not, he's going to be a father, and it's not going to be entirely human. There may be others out there to boot. He's been grabbing ass since Wild Lake. Huh. What if this is what we thought we were brought here to do? Scatter Earth human genes all across the population. <laughs> well, fuck. I've slept around, too. Not nearly as much, mind you. God damn it. Journal Lynch 95. Well, here we are. Ashvale. It's a port town. All wood structures with stone foundations and long docks heading off into the curved port. It's large enough to hold at least six ships, currently three in dock. It has two airship docks, one of which is in use by the Rose. This town has no protective wall around it, no fence, no outer guard patrols. The guards are apparently just here to keep the drunk sailors from beating each other to a pulp. They don't even have a dungeon, no sewage system. They have a lant collection going around for a tannery just outside of town, and everything else gets thrown where it's convenient. The smell is horrendous. We're getting out of here as fast as we can. There's a ship leaving in an hour for Kennel Beach, another port town two days right away by sail, and we booked passage. It's a low draft schooner that used to do long range runs before the airships came around. It's named the Sea Serpent. Very original. Journal Entries 96. Well, the Sea Serpent is, of course, a different experience from airship travel. I have experience on the ocean, just not in a sailing ship. Mike has been seasick since he stepped a foot on this tub. Badass warlock can't handle the motion of the ocean. We're not even sailing that far offshore. I could easily swim to it if I had to. So something has been bothering me. The Sea Serpent was in fact a military vessel, then sold for patrols around Ashvale and is now a cargo hauler. So how does ship-to-ship -ship combat work? I asked around. A few ex-navy dogs were amongst the crew. No cannons. They use a load of easy-to-work wands and have a few magic users to throw around some force. Then they get up close and have a swashbuckling sword fight. Elven Navy, on the other hand, loads up with archers and likes to kite the enemy ship around while pelting it with arrows and magic. They apparently use smaller and faster ships working as packs to accomplish this, but can't do deep sea combat as easy when the seas get rough. There are apparently deep ocean trained mages who can whip up a small storm to gain the advantage. A dwarven or orcish navy is kind of a joke around the sea salts. I wonder if anyone's invented the submarine. They have the magics for it. Someone just needs to implement them. It might not be safe though. There's apparently plenty of sea monsters down there and mermaids, sea elves, and so on. No one can actually confirm if any of those exist, mind you. Just a friend of a friend saw one once after having a drunken drinking contest or some such. Journal Entry 97. Dry Land. Kennel Beach. This is a beachside town. Half of it is in the ocean, built on stilts with hanging walkways between buildings. The chief occupation of this town is fish and shellfish. Lots of fishing nets, traps, poles, the works. There are no docks. Ships drop anchor and they send out big hovering magic disks to move cargo and people back and forth. Well, it certainly keeps unwanted people away from the ships. The ride was smooth. The material felt like glass almost. I'm pretty sure it's some kind of force field spell being put to good use. We're set up in the local inn and are resting for the night. Mike is doing much better, and Marcus got baby troubles off his mind. Between the airship and the ride here, I got a suntan. The trip here has been pretty easy so far. So the locals are tan skinned with an odd accent. Human. It's funny that listing race is now a common thing. I think I've gotten used to all this. How long have I been here again? Anyways, the locals. Superstitious but otherwise friendly. The whole place is run by a coven of sea witches who keep the local giant kraken at bay. I didn't see any sign of any giant kraken, but I'll take their word for it. They're also a strict prohibitionist. Kenild is in fact a dry town, no alcohol allowed. They have a big list of reasons why. Instead, the taverns sell apple cider, orange juice, tea, and rare coffee from far off lands. It's been forever since I've had coffee. It's pretty good too, hazelnut blend. Gotta love when you find a fantasy Panera, huh? <laughs> Journal Entry 98. Well, we're on the run. Turned out those assholes on the Sea Serpent stole most of our money at some point. By the time we found out, they were all on their ship, and the locals weren't going to send a disc over to help deal with it. Wasn't their problem as far as they were concerned. I got to the furthest outbuilding and still couldn't reach them. 
but Mike could. So while they're taunting us from the deck, and me, Marcus, and Jason are just screaming back insults, Mike just up and sets their ship aflame with his black fire. It ignited beautifully. So the sea serpent is sinking in flames off the coast, and of course, this is attracting attention. We manage to make it to the inn and hide out while the sea witch's men search for us. They aren't too happy that we clogged their beach with a sunken flaming wreck. I don't care. Those asshole sailors had it coming, and I'm sure none of them died. The shore was right there. So we make a quick plan to get out of town. We still need money. So we hold up the innkeeper. He doesn't know what a pistol is, so just tase him before he could reveal himself to be a retired adventurer, and we took everything in the money box. It wasn't much, 20 silvers and a handful of coppers. Not enough to really get us anywhere. So I mind wipe the incident out of the innkeeper's head, and we get the hell out of town with the guards or elsewhere. So yeah, we're horrible people, and I don't care, because it was the best thrill I've had in a while. None of us are even mad at Mike for starting the whole thing either. So we ran full tilt down the road. I'm not sure how long it will take to get to Wolf Lake by foot, probably a week. Journal Entry 9-9 Two days on the path and we get jumped by a band of 20 or so orcs, right where the map said beware orcs, right where those assholes said I could ignore it, pacified. They weren't bandits, but they were a war party. I started having Winterfield Barbarian flashbacks but their minds weren't entirely hostile, more worried. We got interrogated at Sword and Spear Point. They're out here keeping reinforcements from getting to Wolf Lake. Apparently a war between the pacified orc tribes of the region and the kingdom of Wolf Lake is about to kick off. Again. We ensure them that we are not reinforcements and had no idea what the hell was going on out here and that we're just passing through. Left out the whole off-worlder King Slayer ship burning parts. They were being mostly truthful and so were we. So the reason for the war. The orcs didn't like being pacified. They were a brutal warrior culture with their own honor system. And while they weren't committing acts of banditry and rape, the local kingdom decided they wanted those lands and that the tribes could suck it. Thus the war. Wolf Lake won and started a campaign of pacification on survivors to cull the herd of that silly tribal violence. It may have worked, but instead produced a more tactical minded breed rather than turning them into willing subjects. So we were handed an ultimatum, and it took some mental manipulation between myself and Marcus to pull it off. So mercenaries working for them, or slaves, is still not what we are aiming for, to just be set free, but it is better than any alternative. So we're being press ganged into the Grand Army of the United Orc Tribes as mercenaries. We get paid too, if we survive. Better than slaves, or dead. General Entry 100 So we spent a few days moving from camp to camp with the Orc Patrol. We finally got dumped off in some larger war camp. There must be a few thousand Orcs, some goblins, hobgoblins, and even some half-orcs here. We're the only humans here though. We were introduced to the High Command, battle-experienced warlords, a few wise old shamans, an Orc paladin of some warrior god and even a druid. Every smile is a mouthful of bad dentistry. The first thing they told us was that deserters get tortured, then killed. After that, they got our scales down, and then we got assigned a tent and told to stay out of the way. They'll call us when they need us. No pink skin jokes so far, so that's a plus, I guess. The place doesn't smell as bad as I thought it would. Sure, orcs have a different smell to humans. All the races do. Some are horrible like kobolds or goblins. Orcs... Orcs smell like war. Things were kind of grim until Marcus broke out his guitar and started playing. They allowed it. After a while, they liked it. Sure, he didn't know any traditional orcish songs, but he lightened the mood. Food, on the other hand, is a different matter. Hard tack and raw meat. We had to cook ours. They don't cook theirs. This is going to take some getting used to. Journal Entry 101 I got called out today. One of the younger warriors wanted to see why we were here, and decided the best way to do that was to challenge me to a practice duel. It didn't go well for me. I got thrashed pretty good. I think I got a concussion from it. Luckily, there are healers around camp, and I got fixed up. I think he felt sorry afterwards? He showed up a few hours later again and decided to tutor me and the others so he weren't such an embarrassment. So, I'm working my ass off with a sword on a practice dummy while someone screams at me, often in another language, all day with the others. It's tiresome, but I understand that this is stuff I should learn. We're gonna be at this for a while. Sword play isn't something you pick up instantly. At least I'm not a novice, like I was in those earlier days. 
Later, we gathered up and discussed exactly what the fuck we were doing. We're allied with what would typically be the evil races in fiction versus the shining might of humanity. I can't really say anyone here is evil. I mean, sure, they have violent tendencies, but when it comes down to it, this is imperial versus tribal in a land grab. It's a gray situation if I ever saw one. So what can we offer for the war effort? Well, none of us have ever served the military back home, and we're not exactly tacticians either. The best we could offer was trying in vain to describe horse stirrups to the master armorer. They don't have those here. In other news, my shiving razor has become useless now. I have to learn to shave the local way. The orcs use sharp knives. This is going to be a fun learning experience. Ah, shit, I cut myself. Journal Entry 102. A prisoner was brought in from a patrol skirmish today. After spending a few hours beating the shit of him and getting no worthwhile information, they remembered they had a mind taker on the team and called me over. <laughs> no, I got what they wanted. I got more than they ever wanted to know. From tactical information to his daughter's birthday, his son's first wooden sword. Yeah, I made them feel ashamed. I burned it in their heads. Why? They've been suffering at the hands of the kingdom for so long, they've begun to demonize non-orcs. So yeah, I reminded them that they're people too, even if they're enemy soldiers. I also saved that prisoner's life. He's going to be held somewhere else until the war is over, rather than the original plan of just killing him and sending his body back as a message. The warrior paladin liked the idea, and decided to take it a step further, to start a prison camp for surviving enemy combatants so they can claim the moral high ground. Not optimal, but whatever. Respect points to the paladin. Journal Entry 103 So I am banned from gambling here. They have a simple dice game that the warriors play to keep themselves occupied when drinking and decided that I could make the dice roll any way I wanted. I can't. I'm not telekinetic. I bet I could make them think it landed on whatever I wanted though. The only difficulty would be affecting all of them. So there are no women amongst the warriors here, but there are warrior women, just not here. They have their own camp half a day away on foot. That said, there are non-warrior women around. They run the supply chain, moving goods in from the tribal lands to the main camp here and distribute them outwards from here. They are constantly on the move. Anyway, today we got our hands on some goblin beer. It was surprisingly good. Not as good as Dwarf Brood, but a respectable second place. Marcus disappeared for a while and came back saying he got lucky. That said, the supply train wasn't in town today. Just how much did he drink? We're going to have to have a talk with him when he wakes up. Mike has found a use for himself and has become some kind of assistant for one of the camp shamans. He's the only warlock in camp and I guess they have a need for his skills. Jason, on the other hand, has found one of his guildies in the camp and has been doing whatever it is they do when they aren't stealing everything. High Command has decided I'm trustworthy enough to ensure we don't have any spies in the camp. Easy enough to do. Spies will be secretive, and the more you try to keep a thought a secret, the more you point it out to me. It's like trying to hide a car by standing in front of it and screaming there is no car there over and over again. Journal Entry 104 Opening to the camp emotion can be pretty rough, especially with this crowd. Lots of pride and fear. People are missing families or having revenge floating around them at all times. More prisoners came in, a whole outer patrol. Things are starting to heat up, I think. I pulled some technical information from them, but not all of it was consistent. Either Wolf Lake doesn't know what they're doing, or they're feeding their patrols incorrect information should they get caught or overheard. High Command seems to think it's the latter. Either way, the patrol came close to the camp, so it's time to move. We're packing up, and we're marching come sunrise. We watch Strange Days tonight. It's funny. This decade-old cyberpunk movie has become a symbol for home. We know all the dialogue by heart by now, but we still get a reactionary moment. Will I be able to mind walk there, or is this something I can only do here? I don't know. Why the hell am I here? Journal Entry 105 Well, the last few days were pretty rough. Packed up and marched for two days without stopping aside from a single short meal. Set up camp, and I promptly crashed into my bedding and passed out. I'm a little sore, but I'm feeling alright otherwise. More sword practice sure hasn't helped though. So Marcus got a fancy new dulcimer from some goblin tinkerer he impressed. It has a very different sound from his beat up guitar, 
but he adapted pretty quick to it. It made me realize that my sword's pretty beat up too. So I took it over to the smith and he's doing what he does. In other news, High Command decided to send Jason off with one of the patrols. He thought it would be fun. I hope he doesn't get captured. Journal Entry 106 As a headless man once said, winter is coming. The temperature has been slowly declining, but today was the first time I really noticed it. Jason's patrol is still out, not expected to return for a few more days. Got my sword back, shiny as a day was made and sharp. The smith did a good job, and not only that, he figured out what we were going on about and made the first stirrups. He made about three sets and is letting the cavalry mess with them. So far, they've been getting a positive review. The supply caravan arrived today and some new recruits. A hundred or so hired human mercenaries and a hill giant who won't stop cracking lame jokes. He's loud enough to hear from everywhere and he won't stop. Marcus said he's going to teach him some new one. What do people that big even eat? Whole cows? So the mercs set up near us Terrans and I've been listening to their amazingly exaggerated war stories all night. Most of them are ex-adventurers who decided being homeless sucked or were taking up the family business. A few are criminals that are looking for a new lease on life or have something against the Wolf Lake. Journal Entry 107 I managed to get some info about Wolf Lake from the mercs today. Turns out this whole area has been a warring shithole for as long as there's been history. It's named Wolf Lake because the whole place used to be overrun with werewolves and then later shifters who settled here. Then the elves came in and wiped everyone out and settled. Then the orcs came and kicked the elves out. Then the dwarves discovered gold in them their hills and started a war. Then humans. Rinse and repeat in different combinations for thousands of years. The only thing that hasn't changed is the name and the previous residents scattered out and become wild tribes. On the other side of Wolf Lake's border is apparently remains of the original shifter community that's been successfully pacified, and some wild elves in the woods to the east. The dwarves, on the other hand, decided it wasn't worth it and left the area long ago. I don't see why it keeps happening. The area isn't great. The ground is rocky, so farming's a bitch. The only mineral wealth was mined out long ago, and the lake is murky. I don't get it. Journal Entry 108 Jason's patrol arrived today, decimated, but victorious. As Jason excitedly told me while on an adrenaline high, they plowed right into a trap and were captured in some kind of magic stun net, put in chains and led off to be interrogated. Jason managed to slip out of his chains over the course of the night and freed the rest of the patrol, armed up and fought their way out, wiping up the patrol camp at a cost of losing half their numbers. He had the presence of mind to grab maps and papers from one of the tents and hand them over to high command. The survivors then fought their way back, surprising and taking down another Wolf Lake patrol on the way back, and heavy losses. Jason's pretty beat up, but he survived at the least. After the adrenaline wore off, he kind of went into shock once he realized what he just lived through and is sleeping for now. I hope they don't lead anyone to the war camp. Either way, High Command is impressed and praised everyone involved. I've been picking up a lot of anxiety since then coming from their planning tent. I guess that intel Jason grabbed did not have good news in it. Journal Entry 109 Well, the cavalry has been completely outfitted with stirrups and they're working on new routines and tactics. Did I go too far by releasing this idea? It's such a small, simple idea, but the consequences are far reaching. To make matters worse, I released it to a bunch of warlike non-humans. I mean sure, they aren't really bad people, but I'm sure the Mongols weren't either if you got to know them. I just get the feeling that maybe I started something that I shouldn't have. So High Command has decided it's time to take action. They want to do something before the snow starts falling. We're going to be taking a small outlying farming community that's been seized by the Wolf Lake Army for supplies. We're going to strip it of everything of value and burn it down to deny the position to Wolf Lake. Then move on to a secondary target while our camp moves further east for a more defensible position in the mountains. In the meantime, the scout patrols have managed to capture the main trade skiff from Kennel to Wolf Lake River Run and destroy it. We're slowly cutting off their supply lines. I guess we then seize the shit out of the place. I wonder if they have trebuchets. And that's the end of part one. Part two to come next Saturday. Really am glad you guys are enjoying this particular story and are sticking around to listen to it. If you like the story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia and click the bell icon so you know when the videos are released through the week. Old Necky and Miss Necky are getting pretty close to the 100,000 mark and they're really excited. It sure would be great if y'all could help them get there. 
Even though I don't get anything, it would be really good to see them have that nice little shiny plaque. And then I guess Neck can put his balls on it. I don't know. This has been Guard Bro, and I will see you next time.